right? Started now. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome uh, to our second Cant Around uh, the World lecture. Uh, today, it's with a great pleasure uh, that I'm introducing Professor Tiago uh, Aragao. Uh, professor Aragao is an associate uh, professor at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. He is also the coordinator of the Geotechnical and Pavement Laboratory there, and also he's the coordinator of the Center of Technology Extension uh, at the same institution. Sorry. Uh, his research in interest includes the, the rheology and the multi-scale behavior of the asphalt uh, material. Uh, in addition to that, he works a lot on the asphalt concrete testing and also modeling. Uh, today, he will give us a, a, a big overview uh, about uh, a new method that uh, he's working on, which is the constituent-based uh, characterization of the asphalt material. Uh, as usual, all of the questions will be, uh, will be left at the end of the presentation. Uh, in order to ask your question, what will happen is once uh, Professor uh, Aragao is, is done with his presentation, you can either virtually raise your hand uh, within the participant tab, or you can ask your question in the chat and I'll ask it uh, on your behalf. Uh, without further delays, please join me in welcoming Professor Aragao. Professor, you, you may share your screen now. Professor? Professor Aragao, can you hear me? I, I think you, you're muted. Hello, Isaac. Yes, I can. I can hear you now. Can you hear me now? I'm sorry, yeah, I could yes. not hear you, so I disconnected and came back. Yeah, sorry. yeah, it's okay. It's totally fine. Can you please start sharing your screen? I introduced you. Uh, I'm not sure if you heard the introduction. No, no, I, I didn't. But that's fine. I will. I will share my screen. Just a second. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Can you please uh, put it in the uh, presentation mode? Sure. Yes, it's, it's perfect. You may start, thank you. Oh, okay. So um, I couldn't hear what you said before, but I thank you and Professor Alcadi's group and himself for the invitation. To me, it's a great pleasure to be with you guys today. And uh, I think, the idea is that I will present a little bit of the recent advancements made by our group and our partners. And then later on, we have some time for discussions, right? I think that's, that's uh, the arrangement. So today, I'm going to talk a little bit about recent uh, advancements, as I said, that we have been making in the mm -hmm. area of constituent based mechanical characterization of, of asphalt binders and mixtures. And before I start, I would like to uh, mention that this is part of a big effort, a national level uh, effort by several institutions in Brazil. Actually, we are now uh, 18 in universities and they are all connected uh, by Petrobras in projects that Petrobras, mm -hmm. our oil company has with the different institutions. And here in the screen, on the screen, I put uh, a, a picture of a good friend of mine, Dr. Luis Nascimento, who manages those projects. And more than that, he um, is also a good technical par a partner of the, of the projects. In addition to the 18 Brazilian institutions, 
we have been also working in those projects with four international institutions. Uh, with us at Federal University mm -hmm. of Rio de Janeiro, we have Professors Young Rakim and Professor, Professor Young Rakim and Professor Richard Kim from Texas A&M University in North Carolina State. And uh, with uh, the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul, we have Professor Hal Wong and Professor Andrew Dawson from Rutgers and the University of Nottingham, respectively. Okay. So let's go to the technical part. Um, everything we do related to this topic is it starts with this uh, concept here. It's the idea that flexible, flexible pavements are complex uh, structures. And to understand this type of complex structure, we quite often have to make some assumptions and simplifications, right? But the idea is that we don't want to uh, just accommodate with those assumptions and simplifications forever. And we want to go uh, to move forward and try to understand uh, a little more about those uh, assumptions and try to overcome the challenges as we acquire knowledge. Um, and some of the complexities involved in the flexible pavement uh, problem are related to the surface layer. We know that the asphalt concrete layer is a quite complex material. And some of the reasons for that are probably that uh, they are subjected to multiple types of distresses. Uh, those distresses are related to multi-scale and multi-physics problems. We have a quite heterogeneous material. That material behaves not as elastic, but rather as inelastic material. And we have a quite uh, complicated damage behavior. To address those complexities, uh, there are several approaches that try um, to uh, work on them. And the one that we uh, selected was uh, based on uh, what we think it's uh, quite convenient, which is the constituent based approach and it's within the context of a multi-scale approach mm -hmm. and and the idea behind that is that uh, the behavior of the material itself can probably be better understood and we can probably design better materials if we understand and if we characterize well the constituent uh, in the in uh, the constituent characteristics okay so in order to do that we have been working on uh, different scales. Um, this slide shows the, the whole picture of what we are trying to accomplish. Um, up to now, we have been working heavily from this scale, the microscopic to nanoscopic scale. We are not working very heavily yet on the molecular scale, although one of my main partners, Professor Young Rakim from Texas A&M University has already been uh, done some has already done some work on that, but we are uh, in our group. We are actually working more on AFM uh, characterizations of binders, on fine aggregate matrices, on asphalt concrete mixtures, and some work connecting the asphalt concrete mixtures to the actual pavement. Okay. The constituent based approach as it says, the name says, it's, it's very, um, it depends a lot on the good characterizations of the material behavior. To do that, we have been using several pieces of equipment and some of them are shown here. And the equipment that we, that we select for the characterization depend on the scale that we are trying to connect, on the scale that we're trying to understand the behavior of the constituents to um, explain the behavior of the overall material. We believe that this type of understanding on how the constituents behave and interact can allow us uh, a, a, an optimization of the material selection process and result in mixture that are probably more resistant to damage and uh, less costly. Okay. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the recent work on these different scales that um, we have been uh, 
getting results based on our student, my student work, my partner's work, and, and in different labs that we interact with, okay? So I'm gonna start with characterizations of the binder uh, microstructure uh, properties, let's say, using atomic force microscope. Uh, in those characterizations, we use mainly two equipment, the uh, atomic force microscope, as I said, and I'm gonna uh, sometimes call it AFM, and the dynamic shearometer that is often called as TSR. Okay. So we believe that the atomic force microscope or the atomic force microscopy mm -hmm. uh, is a modern technique that can allow us to identify micrometric and nanometric scale characteristics of the materials. The study of the binder composition and microstructural characteristics can facilitate again the idea of the material selection process and help us better understand the mechanical behavior of the material. So the goal for this part of the work was to develop a procedure for the determination of morphological properties of, of the binder constituents and mechanical characteristics of those constituents. To do that, we have developed uh, a few procedures, and those procedures are uh, probably can, can be probably summarized into two main procedures. The first one is this one on the left, where we scan the surface of asphalt uh, binders to try to identify uh, the the different microstructural constituents as they appear in the uh, topographic images. And the second procedure is, uh, instead of a scanning procedure, is uh, an indentation procedure. So the, the image here on the right illustrates that. And what we do here is instead of having the needle moving to get the topographic images, we select the positions. Let's say if we come to an image like this one in the middle, we select the material that we want to, to indent. And then we press that material in a specific location to get uh, mechanical properties. So far, the mechanical property we have been working on is the creep compliance, okay? So the results I'm gonna show are all based on papers that we have been publishing and on some papers that we um, have submitted res recently and are being um, evaluated. This one, for instance, was published in 2017, and it's basically a basically, um, uh, summary of a, a master thesis of one of my students who is now finishing her PhD with me. And by that time, what we wanted to do was to create uh, a procedure to identify changes that occur in the microstructures of asphalt binders when the materials are aged or rejuvenated. Re rejuvenated. To do that, we created, as I said, a digital image uh, analysis technique uh, using different pieces of software. And we could monitor different material characteristics, such as the air fraction of the constituents as the material aged and was rejuvenated. And all of that was done in, uh, in uh, uh, we, we quantified those changes. Um, we also um, developed a procedure to determine the size distribution of the bees. So we didn't want just to say if the bees um, uh, increased in size or decreased, but we also wanted to quantify. So we created some sort of gradation curve, uh, set of gradation curves for the different materials. And then we also evaluated the spatial distribution of the bees because we wanted to see if the materials when uh, in, in the different aging conditions, if we had um, a homogeneous distribution of the inclusions, if we did, which is what we expected, we could probably select testing samples from anywhere from the binder. But if not, um, we could probably have different results by getting uh, samples from the different, uh, different samples for testing. 
we also went ahead and tried to uh, evaluate correlations between those microstructure characteristics and uh, some rheological properties. You can see probably those three on top. Many of you know them: dynamic shear, uh, dynamic shear modulus, phase angle, and JNR uh, from MSCR. Uh, we had uh, three phases from AFM: uh, the katana phase, para phase, and Phase. And we also had several chemical properties that were, were obtained with the help of our friends from Petrobras. And what we did in this, at the end of this paper, was try to evaluate correlations among those different properties. And that was pretty much a preliminary uh, analysis because we didn't have um, uh, a database that, it, that, it, that was as large as we have today. And also, by that time, we assumed that all the correlations were linear. We could identify strong correlations between uh, the, the AFM properties and the rheological properties. That was not observed for the chemical properties. But again, that was a quite preliminary study. And now we're working more heavily on that. The second procedure that we uh, uh, developed in our AFM characterizations was the procedure to determine the crypt compliance of each binder constituent. And in order to do that, we had to overcome several challenges. And this is a challenging uh, 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 technique. Uh, everything here is challenging because we deal with very small displacement in the order of microns to uh, nanometers. So everything is very sensitive. But anyway, we developed that procedure and we documented the procedure in a few papers. One of them was recently published at Construction and Building Materials. Um, whoever is interested, we can probably share those papers later. And um, the idea here was that we would get everything within the limits of linearity. Uh, we want to move uh, slowly. We don't want to have damage uh, in the beginning of our uh, analysis. So now what we wanted to do was to develop a procedure to evaluate linear viscoelastic properties and rather than damage. To do that, we uh, checked the levels of loads that guaranteed that we were within the limits of linearity. And, and that was done considering the superposition and homogeneity principles. With the um, uh, proper load, proper loads determined, we went ahead and obtained the creep compliance for the different binder constituents. I'm not going to talk about the trends here. I think that's not the purpose in this presentation. Uh, there is a lot of discussion in the papers that I mentioned, and, and in this paper, we have discussions on those trends. So again, if you want, you can probably take a look at the papers later, and we are happy to chat with you. But our main uh, message here is probably this one. Uh, we, we were very happy when we were able to overcome challenges and uh, characterize the microstructural changes as the material aged and rejuvenated. And we were also happy to get the mechanical properties of each binder constituent. But um, when we finished those first uh, parts of, of this research, we were concerned with the validity, with the applicability of those values. We were not sure if the values that we were uh, obtaining from those two procedures were actually representative of the material uh, properties. So in order to evaluate that, what we did was we, uh, just a second, my phone keeps, Mute. Okay. Sorry. So in order to do that, we thought that we should um, probably investigate if the combination of here, if the combination of the microstructural characteristics obtained from the first stage and the uh, uh, creep compliance of the material constituents obtained in the second phase if they were used together, if they were combined, um, 
their magnitudes or the values that we got for both uh, sets of properties would probably be um, valid if with them we could predict the overall mechanical behavior of the binder in a given test. So to do that, we um, developed this very simple test. We uh, had a, a certain amount of binder poured in into a metallic mold. We uh, applied a compressive load on top, uh, and that compressive load was monotonically increasing. And we simulated that using a finite element uh, program Abacus. Okay, so the simulations were divided divided into two. The first one, which is this one on top, was uh, considering the material heterogeneity. So we had uh, the uh, geometric characteristics from phase one and the creep compliance from phase two for each by the constituent. We simulated a represented, representative volume element and that was identified in phase one, in phase one as 40 by 40 micrometers. And then we obtained what we called a homogenized creep compliance. At the end of this first set of simulations, we use the homogenized creep compliance as input to simulate the actual uh, test, uh, the test geometries and, and using the actual boundary conditions from the test that we developed in the lab. And with that, uh, this is just an example of the microstructures that we use to create our finite element meshes. But with that, we compared the results that we obtained with the numerical simulations, which are those uh, full lines, with the results for the corresponding experimental tests, okay, which are those dashed lines. Uh, we did that for three aging conditions, the virgin binder, which is this one, the aged binder and the rejuvenated binder. And the comparison between the experimental and the numerical results, and again, the numerical results based on all those properties that we obtained in phase one and phase two of the AFM characterizations. So the comparison between um, the experimental and those numerical results was very good. And uh, that made us really happy because now we could uh, be more confident that the uh, properties that we obtained in the nanometric scale, ma micro to nanometric scale, were valid and could be adopted, okay? So as conclusions for this part, uh, AFM is a useful tool for the identification of microstructural characteristics of asphalt binder constituents. The microstructural components of asphalt binders behave as viscoelastic materials, and I, I had this, uh, question in my mind. I'm not, I was not sure if the bees, for instance, were viscoelastic, but actually all four were viscoelastic. Uh, their uh, mechanical properties were not constant with the, the loading time. Uh, the proposed AFM procedure allowed the characterization both mm -hmm. of the geometric characteristics and of the uh, creep compliance of the individual binder constituents. Mm -hmm. And the numerical experimental model demonstrated the applicability of the binder constituent properties, uh, as we could predict the behavior of the binder, uh, mechanical behavior of the binder in that test, that compressive test, okay? So that was about this scale here, the binder scale. Now I'm gonna talk about the fine aggregate matrix and some efforts that we have made in the recent years. Uh, to characterize the fine aggregate matrices, uh, we have been working a lot with the DSR, but later on in the presentation, I'm going to show that we're also working with uh, more sophisticated pieces of equipment, such as tomographers and uh, uh, scanning electron micros uh, uh, microscope. Uh, okay. So it was interesting uh, to me when I realized that actually when we move from AFM to FAM, we're just scrambling letters. So it looks like we, we really enjoy working with, with those three letters, AF and M. Um, so we put a lot of attention in the FAM phase because we believe that that material is a primary constituent of asphalt concrete mixtures. 
And we also believe that a lot of damage that happens in the acid concrete mixes for several conditions, they start and they actually propagate within that material, within the fan, okay? So because of that, we believe that fan needs to be treated with a lot of care. We should um, work carefully on the development of fan design protocols and also on fan fabrication protocols to obtain testing specimens that are representative of the materials uh, that are in the aso concrete mixtures. So uh, here, the idea is that we can probably design and fabricate isolated FEM samples as long as those samples are representative of the FEM that is in the aso concrete composite, okay? In addition to that, we believe that the FEM design protocol, protocols, they require the understanding on complex parameters, such as the binder film thickness, the surface area of fine aggregates, and the air void distribution of the aso concrete that is actually placed within the FEM. So some work that we have been doing with FEM, this one was published in 2014 at uh, TRR, Transportation Research Record. And the idea here was that we wanted to characterize the rate dependent fracture of uh, FEM mixtures. Um, as some of you know, we work uh, a lot with um, simulations, right? Constitutive models. And in our constitutive models for the microstructures, for the simulation of the microstructures of aso concrete mixtures, the FEM is one of the, uh, the constituents, as, as I said, right? So in order to simulate aso concrete fracture, we uh, had to uh, determine fracture characteristics of the FEM. And one question that we had by that time in 2013 to 14 was, if we could get those parameters, fracture parameters, out of any of those sample geometries, uh, the semi semicircular bending test has been used quite often, including uh, by our group. But those other two, the DCT and the SEB, have also been uh, used a lot. Actually, there is a standard, uh, I think the first standard among those for asphalt mixes was for DCT. And uh, we wanted to evaluate if the fracture properties that we got from those three geometries were actually properties or parameters. If they were dependent on the geometry, they would not be able, we would not be able to call them properties, but rather parameters. But we wanted to investigate if we were, would be able to call them properties, okay? So to do that, we developed um, a feedback loop uh, scheme so that the actuator load, which is actually what we control in our machine, the universal testing machines, um, we would like to control the actuator movement to guarantee that the crack tip opening displacement here would be the same for all the geometries. Given that we were comparing the fracture parameters that we hope to be properties among the different geometries, we thought it would not be fair if we control that um, in, in the actuator only, right? So what we did was we created that feedback loop to make sure that we were applying the same opening rate at least at the initial crack tip here at the notch, okay? So we went, we went ahead and simulated all those geometries. We had uh, SCB geometry with 50 millimeter of potential fracture area, uh, poten potential fracture length on here. Uh, SEB also with 50 millimeters. And uh, DCT, this one with 82.5 millimeters as a potential uh, length here, because this is the, uh, what the standard requires and recommends. And we also uh, tested DCT with 50 millimeters to be compatible with the SCB and SCB geometries. We simulated all those tests uh, and we got the fracture parameters that would guarantee a good match between the numerical simulation and the experimental results. With those results, 
we have evaluated the two uh, main fracture parameters from our fracture model, and we use the bilinear cohesive zone model. And those parameters were cohesive strength and cohesive fracture energy. With the results, we observed that in general, of course there are some variations, but in general, those uh, parameters were quite similar for the different geometries that were evaluated. And um, the, the, these results from the fracture energy, we plotted again here at the bottom graphic, and they are on the white bars, okay? And we compare those results with fractal energies obtained from experimental curves of force and displacement. So uh, there are several, several times that in the literature, the fractal energy is calculated as the area under those force displacement curves or stress strain curves. And uh, the idea is that we may include include when we do that, we may include other sources of energy dissipation that are not necessarily only dissipation by fracture, right? So uh, when we do that, we get mm -hmm. force, the area is on the force CTOD or force CMOD, and let me illustrate what CTOD and CMOD are. CTOD is here, is the cracked tip opening displacement, and CMOD is here, is cracked mouth opening displacement. So when we get uh, those curves, force, CTOD or four CMOD curves and get the areas under those curves and call that fractal energy, we actually include uh, other sources of this energy dissipation. For instance, the, um, the viscoelastic dissipation, the, the, the dissipation just because the material is a viscoelastic material. So the viscoelastic deformability of the material dissipates energy and that is included in the area here under those curves. And that creates values of the fractal energy that are in general larger than the values that we got when we simulated those uh, properties in the, in the uh, considering our numerical ex experimental scheme. And that was expected. We believe that when we get the numerical experimental fractal energies, what we're doing is we are getting closer to the fracture process zone rather than including lots of energy dissipation that occurs further from the uh, fracture process zone, okay? We continued that work and we evaluated the same concept for three different temperatures, minus 10, 10, and 25 degrees Celsius, and three different uh, loading rates, uh, uh, half millimeter per minute, one millimeter per minute, and two millimeters per minute. And in general, as we can see here, the white bars, they were quite, they were consistently similar. And they were, uh, in general, smaller than the fracture energies obtained by the other two methodologies. So that uh, gave us uh, an idea that those parameters, fracture parameters that we obtain with the numerical experimental approach, close to the fracture process zone, they can probably be called as properties rather than as parameters, okay? A recent work that we published this year at TRR, the Transportation Research Record, was also about the FEM characterization, but now what we wanted to see was if we could um, extract testing samples from anywhere of SGC compacted fan specimens. And um, that, it, that is for us very important because um, among the, the different methodologies to fabricate fan specimens, this one that we adopt is, which is based on the compaction on the SGC, it, 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 it's good because it gives us multiple samples out of a single puck that we compact in the lab. Actually, we can extract around 30 specimen test assessment out of one puck. But at the same time, that creates um, some questions on the representativeness of those samples because perhaps we can have a, a, a large variability on the airboy distribution here. And if we get a sample that is in this outer ring, that sample can be very different from the sample that is in the uh, center of the specimen, right? So the idea here was that we compacted 
uh, asphalt pucks, uh, a fan pucks using the suburban gyratory compactor with three different uh, air void contents. And those air void contents are not necessarily representative of air void, air void contents of fans that are within AC. But uh, instead of that, we wanted to evaluate a large air void range, right? So we compacted samples with 341%, 672%, and 1150% of air voids. And we worked with uh, X ray microcomputer tomography to evaluate the air void distribution among those samples, within those samples, and to compare those distributions among the samples, okay? The resolution was around eight micrometers. And with that, we could get about 4,000 cross sections for each specimen. And the file sizes for that were quite large. Was in, they were in the order of gigabytes. So they were quite heavy analysis, but we believe that the understanding of the FAM requires this type of complex analysis. So we performed several statistical analysis, and I didn't want to bring all the tables and uh, tests of hypothesis. But rather than that, I think uh, it's probably better if we just go to the point and I would like to mention what we observed from those results. Okay. So the first thing we observed was that FEM specimens extracted from different locations of SGC compacted samples, they presented varying air void contents, and that was expected. But the relative, the relative differences among those air voids they were in general smaller than 10%. Mm -hmm. So uh, if we're talking about, let's say, 5% of air void in a on average for a given puck, the air void distribution did not vary by more than half a percent. So the, the air voids were between 4.5 and 5.5. Okay, so as an example. Then the air void distributions for the specimens extracted within the same distance from the center of the SGC samples were more homogeneous than those extracted at different distances from the center. So let me go back here. What I'm saying is if we extract samples from this outer ring and we compare their volumetrics, the, those volumetrics, they are more similar than if we compare the volumetrics of samples from the outer ring to sample of the inner ring or of the sample. Okay. <clears throat> so there was no statistical evidence to conclude that the smallest air void range, the 341 to 672, affected the stiffness of the fan. So we can see here that we had quite different uh, air void contents. It's almost twice here the, the 672 is almost twice as 341, but that was not um, um, enough to, uh, to, to change the stiffness of the FEM specimen. And I want to point something out here. This first analysis that was published in this paper was basically based on the evaluation of the stiffness of the material. We are not saying that we can fabricate FEMS uh, with uh, such different air void contents, 341 to 642, and not expect different damage behaviors, okay? Uh, that was not just uh, the scope of this paper. The scope of this paper was limited to the stiffness characterization. So for uh, future work, we will evaluate the effects of that on damage. So continue here. The dynamic shear modulus was significantly affected by the air void variations for the other two intervals. So when we compare 3.4 to 11, 11 and a half and 672 to 11 and a half, the dynamic shear modulus was affected by the air void variations. Okay? It was not just affected, it was just not affected when we compared this small, uh, this, uh, these two the smallest air void contents. Okay? So this one tells us that the volumetric characteristics of fan specimens must be carefully determined to avoid undesired variability. And again, this was not as strong here on the stiffness 
evaluation, but it can be significant if we try to evaluate the image. To finalize this paper, we evaluated different FAMs with, uh, that were fabricated with modified binders, and that was a partnership with the University of Sao Paulo. And uh, we had multiple modifiers, actually, to fabricate those FAMs. They were fabricated with air voids ranging between 1.8 and 4.6 percent. And again, for that range, for 1.8 to 4.6, which is similar to the smallest range that did not show any effects on the stiffness variations. So again, for the modified binder FAMs, within that smallest air void range, we did not observe a change in stiffness as we had uh, this variation of on, on the air void contents. Okay, so although we observe that there is a variability on the air void content within the FEM samples, and uh, and that variability is observed uh, actually also considering the different locations, extraction locations that we select for for to, to obtain the testing sample. So although there there is that variability, some of that variability can in fact be tolerated because as we showed. Uh, the, that is small, that variation may not affect the stiffness of the material. Again, this was all based on stiffness characterization, and we should be very carefully when we select the amount, the, the, the testing specimen, fan testing specimens, um, and we need to evaluate how much on, on the parameter that we are trying to measure, being it stiffness or damage, how much that air void variation will affect the parameter, okay? Can you hear me well, Isaac? Yes, we can. Okay. So moving on, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our acid concrete characterizations and the main uh, pieces of equipment that we are using for that are our um, AIMS-2, aggregate image system two um, that we use to characterize morphological characteristics of aggregates and our MTS universal, universal testing machine. An early study that uh, we conducted when I was still at the University of Nebraska with Professor Young Rakim before he moved to Texas A&M and when I was his PhD student, so one of our um, uh, early studies on this topic of microstructure simulations was the simulation of the dynamic modulus of asphalt concrete mixtures. Again, we had um, everything based on the constituent characteristics. So that, meant, that means that we had to go to the lab, characterize properties of aggregates and properties of fine aggregate matrices as we consider this material as composed by those two uh, uh, phases, okay? So we did that, and by that time, to simulate those uh, microstructures, we were uh, sawing the samples from the lab. So we, we would cut those samples, and then we would scan those samples using uh, regular scanners, and we would need to by that time, we, we needed to, um, uh, to define all the boundaries for each of those aggregates in the images. That was a quite tedious process that could take about a week to process one sample only, okay? But anyway, by that time we did that and we got uh, very good results, as I'm gonna show you. To get those results, we uh, simulated dynamic shear modulus uh, tests from the lab, and we applied the same boundary conditions or representative boundary conditions uh, of those that are applied in the actual tests, okay? We followed Ashton T342 for different temperatures and frequencies. And without any calibrations, we got uh, very promising results by that time, and those results were published at Transportation Research Record in 2010. 
And the results showed a very good match between, between the experimental dynamic modulus and the predicted dynamic modulus with the numerical experimental scheme. Again, everything based on constituent properties. One nice feature of this methodology, as I think we have realized, is that if we want to evaluate the effects of those constituent characteristics on the overall material behavior, we don't need to go to the lab and fabricate the whole, uh, whole samples um, of acid concrete mixtures with different uh, uh, parameters. So for instance, if we want to evaluate the aggregate modulus, we don't, know, we don't need to go to the lab and fabricate new samples with uh, aggregates that have different modul moduli. Rather than that, we can probably have a database with properties of the constituents, the binder, the fan, the aggregates, and um, we can, uh, whenever we're trying to evaluate the effects of those constituent changes, the, the changes on, on, of, on those constituents, on the overall material behavior, we can probably run microstructure simulations, and those microstructure simulations will tell us what will be the overall changes when we modify those uh, constituent parameters, okay? Another set of pictures that I always like to show uh, are these three pictures that, are, that were in my PhD dissertation in 2011, and uh, the, the, the file can be downloaded at the University of Nebraska website. But anyway, so one thing that I like in this methodology, the computational microstructure modeling approach, is that we can evaluate quite uh, interesting uh, 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 phenomena that occur within the samples and that cannot be uh, observed in naked eye, right, in the lab, and, and also by other methodologies. So for instance here, I'm applying a uh, three-point bending. Uh, this is a three-point bending test. And in that test, in the beginning of the test, what we have here is a lot of stress concentrated at the bottom of the specimen, and that makes sense. The specimen is trying to break, and there is a lot of resistance to breakage here at the beginning. Another thing is that, as expected, the aggregate particles, which are in general stiffer than the fine aggregate matrix, they concentrate a lot more stresses here than the matrices, and that, that, that is actually what should happen. One more thing is that we can see the, the, the potential cracking areas, potential cracking locations. And for instance, here we have three potential cracking locations. And as the, the simulations move on, we can see that uh, the cracks that uh, the cracks that fall uh, that the crack follows the path of least energy uh, required to propagate, right? So uh, what I'm saying is uh, this type of methodology allows us to observe different potential cracking locations, but also uh, the methodology allows us to observe the crack propagating in one of those locations, right? Another thing is that we can observe the stress concentrated around the crack tip. So as the crack tip moves, we'll see in the next few slides that that uh, stress concentration moves with the crack tip. So let me go ahead and pass those other two slides. So here, see, this is the first slide. Second slide, the crack has formed. Here we had three potential cracks. Here we had one crack that formed and propagated. And here we had the crack, the, the, the crack pretty much fully propagated to the top of the specimen. So in the first uh, slide, we had a lot of stress concentrated at the bottom. That stress was alleviated as the crack propagated, as expected, because there is no load bearing capacity anymore at the bottom when the crack propagates. Uh, another thing is that the stiffness uh, the, the stresses that are concentrated on the, uh, around the crack tip, that stress moves as the crack tip propagates, right? And again, the stress is, also, is always concentrated on the stiffer 
um, aggregate particles. When the crack moves, see, the aggregate particles that are around the crack tip, they concentrate more stresses than the fan. So those are nice features of the microstructure models that uh, are not available if we use some other uh, methodologies. And um, that's very interesting to us. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here, but we, um, we published results from my dissertation in a few papers. One of them was this one in finite element analysis and design. And the idea here was that we wanted to simulate the uh, asphalt concrete fracture as a rate dependent fracture. To do that, we simulated the aggregates as linear, as linear, elastic, aggregate, as linear elastic materials, the FAM as linear viscoelastic materials with rate dependent fracture properties. And those fracture properties were um, assigned based on, this, uh, on these functions that we implemented as a user subroutine that was incorporated into our models, okay? And here, using those functions, those fracture property functions, we simulated the fracture result, fracture testing results uh, from lab experiments for different rates, and we got very nice uh, matches, okay? Earlier, when I started talking about the asphalt concrete simulations, I mentioned that we had a very tedious process of uh, sample fabrication, virtual sample fabrication, that was based on cutting of uh, lab specimens and then scanning those specimens and um, uh, defining the boundary of the aggregates within those uh, aggregates of those specimens. To overcome that tedious process, I asked one of my former PhD students uh, uh, to develop a procedure to fabricate virtual samples in an accurate way, as much as, as accurate as we could, okay? That was published in 2015 in IJPE, International Journal of Pavement Engineering. And what we did was we used the images from uh, aggregate particles that were acquired using AIMS2. And those images for the different aggregate sources that we had in our lab and from our partners, we created folders for those uh, different aggregates. And with the program that my student created, we could uh, assign properties, volumetric properties, gradation properties, and orientation properties of the aggregates that were uh, representative of what we had in the lab. Those are ex examples of some samples that we fabricated using that software. Uh, as you see, we can fabricate quite complex, quite complicated microstructures varying different parameters that are important to uh, the mixtures. We can also include air voids. We show here air voids that were placed as squares initially, but then later, we, as we place the aggregates with different shapes, we can also place the air voids with different shapes. And that requires only the characterization of the shapes, representative shapes of air voids that now we can get with our tomography images, okay? All the samples here were fabricated with uh, a time of less than 20 seconds. So spending about a week to 10 days in the previous uh, methodology, rather than spending 20 mm -hmm. seconds in this methodology did not sound reasonable to us. So we started uh, adopting this efficient methodology from that time on, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. Other analysis that we are performing to better understand the FAM characteristics, as I said in the beginning, um, they are now uh, on their way. Actually, we have submitted a paper yesterday for the first one, the aggregate surface area, and other two papers, they are being revised and will be submitted in the next few days uh, about those other two topics. Okay, so the idea is that we want to use uh, a complex 
we we understand that we need to uh, use complex devices now so that later on the work with FEM can be simplified. Okay, so to evaluate the aggregate surface area and again define aggregate surface area, which is not something very simple, we have been using the laser granul granulometer to evaluate the air void content of the FEM that belongs to the AC, right? So uh, we have uh, AC and within that AC we have FEM. So we want to evaluate the amount of voids of that AC that is within the FEM. To do that, we're using X-ray microcomputer tomographer. And to evaluate the binder film thickness of uh, the FEMs, we are using scanning electron microscope. Professor, so, um, let me stop here. Yeah, Professor, I, I, I have a question. So do you still have many slides? Because we wanted to allow just the time for a couple of questions before 10. No, no, I think I have just a few more slides. I'm almost done. Yeah, but then we will not, we will not have time to, uh, for questions because the session will be done at 10. Oh, okay. So let me, let me probably then move uh, to the end. Just one more slide here. We're working with uh, also artificial intelligence, and we will get some results published on that soon. Okay, I just want to acknowledge my uh, my partners and students that are part of this work, and our sponsors that uh, help us get those results. Okay, I'm sorry about the time, and I think that's all I wanted to to, to show, and I think we can open for questions. Thank, yeah, you so thank, you. thank you so much for this very nice presentation. I think we'll have time for a couple of questions. So if anybody has a question, please uh, virtually raise your hand within uh, the participant section, or uh, you can also add your question to, uh, to the chat. Isaac, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Jaime. Okay, I do have a question if I may. Yeah, sure, please go ahead. Uh, this is uh, Javier Hernandez from uh, Marquette University. Thank you very much for the presentation. And I was uh, just wondering if you have any comment regarding two assumptions that I noticed in your AC modeling. And correct me if I'm wrong. The first one is that it's a two-dimensional modeling. So uh, any comments regarding the effect that the three-dimensionality of the asphalt concrete might have on the, on the results. And the other one is that I noticed that none of the images that you showed um, presented any contact between the aggregates. So, uh, also, any comments uh, about that? Yeah, they are actually very good questions. Um, you are right. The material is, is a volumetric material. So, we need to uh, evaluate the 3D characteristics of that material. But the problem is when we do that, our simulations become quite computationally intensive, right? They, they are computationally costly. So to overcome that, what we prefer to do is to evaluate the number of two-dimensional samples that perhaps can, um, can be simulated, and we can probably get an average sense of those certain number of samples to be representative of the three-dimensional behavior, okay? That, there was a work done by our partners from Dex, Texas A&M that showed that a given number of samples are enough, two-dimensional samples are enough, to represent well the three-dimensional behavior. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're right about the contact. We, uh, in, in the, the, the samples that I showed you, the virtual samples that I showed you, that we fabricated using our generator, we intentionally did not want to have contact there, okay? But uh, there was a reason for that, but the contact is important for other types of simulations that were not the ones that we were performing in that paper. But you're right, contact is a very important part of the, uh, the formability of the acid concrete mixtures. And then, if I may, as a follow-up, real quick, okay, sorry. If we go to a slide uh, 41, where we compare the, where you compare the, the measured and calculated uh, dynamic modulus results, um, I'm just wondering if, it, did you, if any, uh, numerical values, uh, sorry, I think it's the one before or the one after, where there is this one. 
So here the numerical and the experimental are being compared. Uh, but I just wanted to point out that the vertical axis is uh, logarithmic. So even though the plot shows that the points are close to each other, uh, if we were to calculate the percentage difference, that might be uh, somehow high, I would say. And so my question is, what kind of um, numerical value or object, objective measure do you use to calculate the numerical and the empirical to conclude that there was a good match? That's a very good question as well. Well, what we thought by that time was uh, that if we had those results within the variability ranges that we got when we tested different replicates of the um, astrocentric specimen, then that result would be representative. And by that time, I'm showing here average values, of course, of the uh, testing specimen. But by that time, we had several uh, uh, specimens tested, and the numerical results were within the, the, the range, let's say, the band of variation for the lab results. Great, thank you. Uh, Professor Alcadi had a question. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. That was uh, a very, very interesting and exciting presentation. I congratulate you on this. So uh, I have a quick question. When, when you touch on, on the fracture testing, uh, I noticed that uh, you talked a little bit about the difference between the, the modeling and, uh, and the results that you get from the experiments. Now, there is few things that may impact on that. And if, if you can elaborate briefly, because I know that your time was very limited here is uh, the inhomogeneity of of the material excellent yep that's that was the slide so the inhomogeneity of the material uh, the way that you are measuring the opening of the crack this is usually a good way to do it but it's uh, it's impractical that's why we went to the inline uh, measurement and how much of the dissipation is going into the creep i mean that's all going to be impacting uh, the modeling versus the uh, the measurements. So what what of these impacts you were considering as you were doing your analysis? Well, uh, if I understand correctly, you were you were asking about the practicality, uh, the practicality, let's say, of this uh, whole feedback loop process and um, what was involved in our, let's say, the concept that were involved here so that we decided to move and go ahead and, and work with that complex uh, arrangement. Is that, is that what you're asking, Professor? No, that, I think, I, think I, I do agree that when you are measuring that like this, it's, it's really good. But I said for practicality, uh, you can just use inline. But my question is specifically, is as the crack propagate, you are dealing with several things. The inhomogeneity, you may get uh, an aggregate uh, uh, in the tip of the crack. Uh, the temperature that you are measuring the fracture, which is going to be di dictating how much of the energy is going to be dissipated for creep and so on. So how much of these parameters, when you did your analysis, you considered in order to compare to experimental work? Uh, we ran um, some analysis to separate damage, let's say, uh, energy dissipation sources. And we could see that was uh, relatively significant dissipation by the viscoelastic deformability. Mm -hmm. So um, that uh, gave us the impression that since we were comparing those uh, testing geometries here, if we used the the customary, let's say, way of obtaining those parameters from the fracture tests, that significant uh, viscoelastic dissipation would be included in what we were calling fracture properties, let's say. So that's why we, we try to avoid that and we try to concentrate on what happened close to the tip. Okay, yep, thank you, yep. Thank you so much, Professor Aragao, on this very nice presentation. I think we won't have more time for for present uh, for question, unfortunately. Uh, if you have any question, uh, you you showed your email at the end of the presentation, so you might, uh, if you wanna get more information about 
special technique that he mentioned or any paper that you also mentioned, you can uh, send him uh, an email. Thank you so much for this very interesting presentation, Professor. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity and for everybody who uh, was here with us. Bye. Bye-bye.